Good morning. Uh, this is Jerry Godwin from Little Rock Church. Um, this is our Sunday school lesson for um, October the 11th, and it's taken from Isaiah chapter 25, verses 1 through 9. And so you can uh, turn that in your quarterly or your Bible. And today um, is the 30th week that we have brought the Sunday school lesson. I never thought it would have been that, that many lessons, but we're good to go for as long as we need to get go. So anyway, um, anyway, let's begin um, today, as always, with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful fall weather that we're experiencing and how it makes us feel that it's... Uh, um, it's so good, and, and, and soon we'll be seeing the leaves change. Lord, you are our, our shepherd, and we shall not want. You, you make us to lie down in green pastures. You, you protect us, and, and you care for us. And even though we pass through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil because you are with us. We thank you, Lord, for your omnipresence in our lives and your omnipotence, your powerful hand and, and your protection. Lord, we praise you for thy salvation. And we get everything that we do and say, we pray will be to glorify your name. Lord, be with us in the few minutes that we have together to share your word. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, and thank you for each one that is listening or uh, may become aware of, of you through what we might say. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Once again, we are in the book of Isaiah, and um, Isaiah was a prophet, a spokesperson uh, for God. And one thing I failed to mention last week was that um, that in the book of Isaiah, I almost forgot, <laughs> the book of Isaiah uh, is probably the most quoted uh, prophet in, in the New Testament. So his words, the word of God through him is very important. And just as a parallel, and I think this might be the last time that I do this, as we were going through uh, Exodus, today's lessons on Exodus um, is when uh, the Israel, Israelites melted the uh, earrings and the gold into a golden calf. So we here we have from the book of, uh, of Isaiah, we have using some uh, Bible words, um, apop apocalyptic and eschatological teachings that normally we find in books, um, we normally think of it in books like the book of Revelation. Now, just like the book of Revelation and the book of Isaiah and other apocalyptic books, this is not a book uh, that should be feared. This is a book that the hearers then and the hearers now should embrace. That is a book of hope. Well, in, in Isaiah chapter 24, we see God's um, judgment. And judgment is, a, is a, a thing that is going to happen. Throughout the whole Bible, we are promised that judgment will occur, that is all-inclusive, and that it is impartial. So we all will be judged, and our judgment will be uh, impartial. 
Now, beginning in verse chapter 25, Isaiah says, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. Now, this goes back to some studies that we have done uh, in, in the past that here, here Isaiah is praising God for whom he is and he is praising his name. Now, remember when Moses asked God, who will I tell the people sent me? And he told him his name was Yahweh, that I am sent you, sent you to Pharaoh. Here, um, Isaiah is praising him for the all encompassing name for God. And he says, you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful, and sure. Now, I have already shot my lesson. (laughs) I I, I do this because um, uh, I have notes everywhere. But um, God had defeated the enemies of Israel. And when he talks about uh, making the city a heap and the fortified city a ruin and the palace of aliens is a city no more, it will never rebuilt, be rebuilt. He may be talking about Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria um, who destroyed um, and, and made captives the northern kingdom of Israel. Also, he could be referring to, as some commentaries say, he may be referring to Babylon, who... Um, uh, made captives of the southern kingdom of Judah. And the Persians under Cyrus the Great in uh, uh, 539 B.C. and the Greeks under Alexander the Great um, eventually defeated uh, Babylon. So the city, the city eventually passed from the scene. And the destruction uh, of the city and the deliverance of the exiles will elicit other nations to be in awe of God. Now, here's something to always remember, that God wants to save and redeem his people for his purpose. And remember the purpose going back to Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and further on down the line, even to the New Testament in Christ Jesus. He wants to be a blessing to the nation of Israel, but he wants the nation of Israel to carry that message to all nations. We as churches, we as individuals that profess the name of Christ need to remember that the gospel message is for and should be delivered to all people. Now, it says that... um, um, Going back that these plans were old, faithful, and sure. These are the plans that that God had. Now in verses 4 and 5, For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy and their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm, and a shade from the heat. 
When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place. You subdued the heat with the shade of clouds. The song of the ruthless are stilled. So, um, Israel, Israel had become a refuge, a shelter, and a shade from outside forces. Either the prophet promises a reversal, Israel will no longer be oppressed by outside forces. Um, Israel will be blessed with wonderful things. And in verses 6 through 9, this is some of the things I've already said, that on this mountain, okay, anytime God wanted to give a message um, to his people, it seems like it was on the mountain. Remember, Moses met God on Mount Oreb which was the same mountain as Mount Sinai. And when they um, went out of Egypt, they once again met on the same mountain. And when he wanted to give them the Ten Commandments, he gave them to them, to Moses, on Mount Sinai, once again the same mountain. Here he is speaking to his uh, to Isaiah, and he says, "On this mountain, the Lord of Hosts will make look for all people, not Israel, not just Israel. Will make for all people a feast, feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines." of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. Now, I can, when it talks about the well-marrowed food, I'm thinking about a big old fat, juicy ribeye steak, which I don't, I'd rather have a sirloin, but anyway, a big old juicy ribeye steak um, a friend of mine just went to him and his wife, actually my wife's cousin, just went to uh, the Angus barn, and he got a tomahawk, uh, this is a phrase I learned from the Master Chef, a tomahawk steak, 46 ounces. And he said it was really good. Um... I will never know, but um, I imagine the first 10 ounces was real good, and there's a law of diminishing returns <laughs> as you get to uh, uh, 20, 30, 40, almost 50 ounces. But anyway, this is a succulent feast, much like in the New Testament in Luke chapter 15, when the prodigal son had left and spent all his money as his inheritance, and he came home and the loving father said, kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a feast. And, and so here we have God is going to give a feast to Israel and all the people. And the well-strained wine means that it's the finest of wine. And we think about the wedding, uh, for Jesus' first miracle uh, where he changed the water into wine um, at the wedding in Cana. And people said, why didn't you ch- save the best wine for last? So this is a perfect, clear, without any sediment in it, wine. And the um, uh, feast, food filled with marrow. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all people, the sheet that is spread of all nations. He will swallow up death forevermore. 
Um, we all know that death is inevitable. We all have an appointment with death. And along when death comes mourning for those that are left, and it, it can become all encompassing. But Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 55 through 57, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? There is no victory in death. Uh, one of my favorite old songs is Victory in Jesus. Victory in Jesus. Jesus gives victory over death. We have hope in the death of our loved ones and in our forthcoming death because of the victory that Jesus had over death and the shroud has been removed and... Um, um, and th- there is victory. And it says, Then the Lord God will wipe away all the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all earth. For the Lord has spoken. Um, he will take away the tears of his people. There will be no more tears in glory. And that should be comforting to us here on earth. Um, All these things will be taken away so we can have an unblemished relationship with God. We will receive the full benefits of knowing God, and we will have an intimate relationship with God, because it says in verse 9, it will, it will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. What a promise that is to all of us that put our faith and trust in God through Jesus Christ. He is our God. He is the one God that in which we put our, our trust. It says we have waited for him so that he might save us. That is his purpose. His desire is that all will be saved. That is his intentional will is that all will be saved. But because of man's freedom of choice, the circumstantial will is that some might not be in the judgment. But the ultimate will of God is that his will will be done. God's desire is to save and redeem his people. Sometimes we mistakenly think about the Old Testament revealing judgment and that the New Testament reveals a love of God through Jesus Christ who redeems us. But grace is found throughout the entire Bible. Second of all, um, God saves us from from something. Um, There is all kinds of destruction around us and all kinds of things that torment all of us. 
But God wants to save us from these external and internal um, factors. Then finally, Isaiah says that God saves us for something. He um, wants us to experience the fullness of the abundant life that Jesus, our Savior, makes available to us. There was a story about um, this sculptor that made, that created what he thought was a perfect angel. And he invited Michelangelo to come and view the angel. Well, Michelangelo could see things that perhaps you and I couldn't see. And I've always said that I would like to see the mountains as a photographer sees it or a painting as an artist sees. Well, here's Michelangelo looking very carefully at this young man's masterpiece. And after he finished viewing it, Michelangelo said, it lacks only one thing, and walked out. Well, can you imagine what that would have done to me? (laughs) Well, it did it to this sculptor. He couldn't imagine what was wrong with his piece of work. And he wanted so bad to go to Michelangelo and say, look, what's wrong? Tell me that one thing that's wrong. But he couldn't, he didn't have the nerve, so he sent... Um, a co-worker to him, to Michelangelo, and the, the guy went to Michel- Michelangelo and he said, um, what, what is wrong with the angel or the sculpted work? And he said, it lacks only life. It lacks only life. Now, you know, we can have the finest cars. We can have the most glamorous job. We can have all the money in the world. We can have so many things. We, we can have what the world can afford. But Jesus was saying, or Michelangelo was saying this point, we need to have a life. And so many people are searching for that life, and, and perhaps you are. You can only achieve the life that God wants for you through Jesus Christ. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, The thief who, who is Satan... The thief only comes to kill and steal and destroy. I come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I want that abundant life. And someone said if if there was no such thing as heaven. I would still want the abundant life for this world, for this earth. However, we know there is a heaven. We know there is eternity. And here is the secret and conclusion is that we can enjoy a piece of eternity in the life in which we live now. That is the life, and and throughout the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament, he wanted them to understand that they could live a life of loving God with all his heart and soul and strength and mind and loving the neighbor as himself, and even loving their enemies. We can have that now. 
by turning our faith and our trust to our Savior, Jesus Christ. He desires to redeem us and save us. If you've never made that choice, make that choice today. If you have made that choice, let us live that life. The world needs that so much at this time. God bless you.